as well. Okay, so before we start talking about the pelvic floor as well as its structure and function, so in terms of myself, so yes, my name is Nav. I didn't. I don't think I introduced me myself at the beginning, and I'm a pelvic floor physiotherapist. So I graduated about five and a half years ago, and as soon as I graduated, I knew I wanted to be in women's health, and that's for a couple different reasons. My mom had a full hysterectomy, which basically means uterus and everything else surrounding the sexual reproductive organs. They were removed, and as a result of that, there were some pelvic health issues that were ongoing, as well in physiotherapy school so this is a two-year master's degree program we got one class three-hour class talking about women's health which i found ridiculous there are a bunch of pelvic floor physios that came in and they basically told us about the pelvic floor conditions that somebody might be experiencing and if they are experiencing it either to refer to a pelvic floor physiotherapist or to take the courses ourselves and i just thought you know why weren't why weren't we being taught that in school why wasn't that at the forefront of our education and so I just dove straight into it. And since then I've been doing women's health as well as men's health. And it's been a huge passion of mine to just educate everybody out there, okay? So let's talk about the pelvic floor. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna be sharing my screen just so you can get a sense of visually where the pelvic floor is. So in a second, you should see a picture of the pelvic floor come up. If you don't, you can just let me know. So that is basically showing someone standing sideways and we're looking in, okay? So I'm showing kind of like the female uh, version of the pelvic floor, okay? So at the front you'll see is the pubic bone. So the pubic bone is basically the part, so if you slide down your hand kind of like by the abdominal area and you press that bony part, that would be your pubic bone. And then at the back we have the spine which ends in the tailbone, okay, that we're sitting on right now unless you are standing. Okay, so behind the pubic bone is the bladder, then the uterus, unless you've had a hysterectomy, which would be, you know, surgical removal of the uterus for a variety of reasons. And then we have the bowel, okay? In red, you'll notice from the pubic bone to the tailbone are the pelvic muscles, okay? So these muscles act as a sling, so they literally have to support all the organs inside. And then also, it really makes it seem like seem like there's one muscle inside, but there's a bunch. I'm gonna show you a different picture in a second, but it just gives you a visual representation of what the pelvic floor is and what it does. So pelvic floor takes care of bladder function, takes care of bowel function, takes care of sexual function, and it's a part of the core, okay? So we're gonna be talking about in detail what the core is, because there's huge misconceptions about the core. You know, Pilates were doing core training. A lot of women postpartum, they want to do core training and they're usually pointing to their abdominal muscles. The core is not just the abdominal muscles and this can really impact the way you're doing exercise because a lot of women out there are walking around and they're being told to, you know, suck in their stomach when they're doing a specific exercise. This could be weight training. They might just be sucking in their stomach um, all day long or they're doing exercises where they're bringing in their belly button towards their spine. If you're doing that, I'm going to ask you to reconsider that. And I'm gonna go more into depth about that in a second, okay? The function of the pelvic floor is different than other muscles in the body. So if you think about the heart as a muscle that contracts all day long, right? The pelvic floor is a set of muscles that are contracting all day long. The only time they are supposed to relax is when you go to the bathroom, okay? So that would be for urination and or bowel movements, okay? That's it. At any other point in time, they have to contract to keep everything in, okay? So that kind of leads into conditions of, okay, well, if a couple drops are coming out, if you're coughing, laughing, sneezing, or you feel like you have to pee your pants, or other things are going out, going on, which we're going to consider and discuss, then the pelvic floor is really not working optimally, and it's not doing its job, okay? So I'm going to stop the share for that picture. I'm going to show you a different one, just so you can get a sense of, you know, the pelvic floor and kind of like how much in depth we really have to go into with it. Um, so you should see kind of, so I've stopped the share for that and you're gonna notice a different picture come up in a second. But yes, the pelvic floor, and as I do that, I'm just gonna keep talking. So the pelvic floor is a part of the core. So you really wanna think about, you know, if you've been told that it's not a part of the core, um, or if you're doing certain exercises that are core exercises, then what exercises are we actually doing? Okay, and what exercises do we actually impact 
when we're doing, you know, Kegels, when we're doing abdominal exercises. So you'll see a different picture show up in a second. So here we go. Okay, so I know it's gonna be like, oh my God, too much information. But you can see here, so this is basically someone lying with their legs open and we're looking in. So you'll see, you know, your urethra where uh, the urine comes out, vaginal entrance, and then, you know, the anal part and the tailbone. And then the glute muscle is basically that big bum muscle that you're sitting in, sitting on right now. So that is the amount of muscle that we have inside. Not a lot of people think about there being muscles around the vagina. Not a lot of people think about, you know, there being muscles kind of like really just like inside of the hips, but these muscles work with your hip muscles, okay? And that just gives you kind of a sense of how much muscle there is. And I know the other picture just makes it seem like there is one, but there is way, way more, okay? So let's talk about then the core and what it actually consists of, okay? And we're gonna do a poll about this kind of after as well. I just like to get a sense of kind of like where people are at. So I'm gonna show you a picture of what the actual core is and then you can kind of be, sometimes people are mind blown when they see this. So you're going to notice, okay? So that is showing someone again standing sideways, okay? At the top is the diaphragm. So that's a breathing muscle, okay? This breathing muscle is a part of the core. So anytime you're breathing, you are activating your core. A lot of people tend to, and we're gonna discuss this later, a lot of people tend to breathe into their chest versus their belly. Okay, so they're not optimally then using their core, which can act actually lead to pelvic floor issues. At the bottom, again, is the pelvic floor. In the middle part is one of the abdominal muscles. It's a transverse abdominus. It's the deepest layer of the abdominal muscles. Usually people know about the six pack muscle that goes all the way along the line in the middle. Usually people know also about the obliques, which are on the side. So if someone's, you know, doing UFC, you know, they usually have very prominent oblique muscles. So when they're punching, it kind of pops out on the side. Okay, no one really knows about the transverse abdominus. It's like saran wrap around the spine. It works with your pelvic floor, your diaphragm, and your back to stabilize everything. And usually when people are trying to do core exercises and bringing their spine to their belly, this is what they're trying to activate. And I would say not the best way because that just activates everything and puts actually a lot of pressure on your pelvic floor. And then finally, we have back muscles here that are the small back muscles. And I would also argue that the hip muscles are also involved in the core. Okay, so if that was a lot of information, I know it's a lot of information, but we're gonna do a quick poll here because I want to know, um, before today, did you know that the pelvic floor was a part of the core? Yes, no, just let me know where you're at. Okay, awesome. So I kind of see it going up and down there and I'll, I'll share the results with you guys for this one. Okay, so I think all the votes are in, so I'm just gonna show this to everybody. So you should be able to see that. Basically, 67% did not know that the core was you know, also consisting of the pelvic floor, and about a third of you did know that the pelvic floor was a part of the core, which is amazing, that's awesome, okay? And now everybody knows that. Okay, great. So let's go into a little bit more about you know what certain signs and symptoms you should be looking out for okay so you're here for a particular reason either to find out more about you know just in general like okay oh my god i have a public floor i didn't know that cool or there's pregnancy or your postpartum you might be having issues you might not be having issues right so we're gonna go over common signs symptoms conditions for you to look out for if you have any symptoms right now, that's that should be a trigger for you to seek help in one way or another. Either go see a public floor physiotherapist, go to your physician, you know, um, seek help somewhere. If you don't have these issues, and just keep them in mind, okay? Because then you will know in the future, you know, hopefully don't have any pelvic issues, but if you do, that's the trigger immediately to go see somebody because then you wouldn't want some of these conditions, they can worsen over time. So you just wouldn't want that to happen. Okay, so the first one we're gonna talk about is bladder because that's what everybody has kind of heard about before. Okay, so let's talk about leakages. Okay, so by leakages, what I mean is, you know, if there's any coughing, laughing, sneezing, um, if you're doing physical activity, or even if you're just sitting around, you know, you might be lifting something, you might be lifting a box, you might be carrying a baby, um, you might be just going for a walk. If there's any amount coming out when you don't want it to come out, okay? This is quite normalized in society. Um, I think I saw in 
Poise ad. Basically, Poise is a company that sells these, you know, leakage pads that you can wear. And um, during the commercial, they said leakages are a common or a normal, actually a normal part of a woman's life. And here are some pads that you can buy for it. Absolutely not. So leakages are common. They are not normal. And we need to really focus on that because any amount of leakage coming out when you don't want it to come out, whether it's with physical activity, whether you're like, oh my gosh, I have to go to the bathroom and you don't make it there in time. Or if you're standing up after your urination and you're like, a few drops came out, that should not be the way your pelvic muscles are working. Okay. They need to be able to support everything inside. Okay. And so if you think about it, so if someone has headaches, migraines, high blood pressure, all those things are common, but they're not normal. But for some reason, because, you know, it's bladder leakage and more women are affected, it's just seen as normal. Okay, so if you know anybody who's experiencing this, if you yourself are experiencing this, just know that it is not normal and it could be a sign of pelvic floor dysfunction. Okay, let's talk about the other end. So bowel leakages. Okay, so this is something that I encounter less for sure. Okay, I think bladder leakages is the one, you know, most people have heard about. And this is, um, that's something that, you know, I, I encounter in clinical practice more as well, but bowel leakages can happen as well as, you know, gas coming out when we don't want it to. Okay. And that is also a pelvic floor issue where the pelvic floor muscles can not support that area. So if something's there, or if you feel urgency and it's coming out, that's a sign that the muscles are not working the way they're supposed to. On the other end is urgency and frequency. So if you're experiencing bladder urgency frequency or bowel urgency frequency, and this I'm very sensitive to because, and this is pre-COVID, but I would go out and, you know, I'm sitting with my friends or my social, social situation. I'm like, wow, that person went five times in, you know, half an hour. That is a sign of urinary urgency and frequency, okay? So the normal amount that we should be going per day, and this is obviously dependent on how much we're drinking, is anywhere from five to eight times for urination. Okay, so if you're going 15 times, if you're going 20 times, if you are thinking all day long about, oh my gosh, where is the bathroom? Like I need to go or you have a constant sense of urgency and it's affecting your quality of life, then or you're waking up at night to go to the bathroom, you know, once, two, twice, three times, then there's something going on in the pelvic floor area. It's either an issue of the muscles are too tight, there's a weakness in the muscles, or really the brain has just gotten used to going to the bathroom. Because the more you go to the bathroom, the more your brain thinks it has to go to the bathroom to the point where it's just going to send you to the bathroom. Okay, which I know sounds crazy, but that's literally what clients say. They're just like, I can't control it. I just have to go to the bathroom. And I've had clients come in and tell me, you know, when I'm in the car, I keep something there. This, this is the male client saying, like, I have a bottle there just in case I need to urinate. If they're going to the mall, they know exactly where all um, the bathrooms are, you know, where all the Tim Hortons are, McDonald's, so they can go in to urinate because it's always on their mind, okay? And you should not have to go through that, okay? And that goes for both bladder as well as bowel, okay? Retention. So that's the third thing we're going to talk about. So that's urinary retention as well as bowel retention. Some people just can't go to the bathroom, okay? So you're probably thinking, what do you mean? Like, I have to pee a lot, like I have to go quite often, I have the opposite problem, but for some people, they get to the bathroom, nothing comes out. They have pain when their bladder is filling. They feel like they go to the bathroom, it didn't completely empty, and then five minutes later, they have to go again. So if this is happening to you, that could be a sign of a couple of different things. It could be a sign that the pelvic floor muscles aren't completely relaxing when they're supposed to, or it could be a sign of pelvic organ prolapse, which I know is like, a big term there that not a lot of people have heard about, which were, but it's a huge thing that we need to be aware about. Um, and that's kind of the biggest thing I like to talk about. So we're gonna be talking about that in a couple of minutes. The biggest thing I would tell you right now, if you have either chronic constipation or you just feel like, you know, I went and then I have to go again, or I went, nothing's coming out, please do not strain, okay? A lot of people out there are straining like they are just trying to push stuff out either with urination or bowel movements. A, that can lead to hemorrhoids, okay? Also, that may lead to pelvic organ prolapse, okay? Again, we're gonna talk about that in a second. So if you feel like you have to strain, there are a couple of different things you can do. You can use a stool underneath your feet so that your knees are higher than your hips or you're going more into a squat position. That literally by itself will help to loosen up the pelvic floor muscles to relax them so stuff can come out. 
Okay. The other thing you can do is if you're using this tool, you're like, oh, it's not really working. My toilet seat is low. You can literally lean forward, put your elbows or your forearms on your knees, do deep belly breathing to help relax the muscles. Please, please, please don't push. It can just lead to so many different issues. And if you've been pushing, you don't have any pelvic issues, just, you know, stop that right now. That's what I would highly recommend. Okay. So those are kind of the three big things for bowel as well as bladder. We're going to now talk about, um, you know what, let's talk about prolapse first, okay, because I've been mentioning it a couple different times. So pelvic organ prolapse, most of my clients have not heard about this. 50% of women after a vaginal delivery are affected by it. Okay, so what is prolapse? So if you think about that picture that I showed you before about the pelvic floor, someone standing sideways um, and the pelvic floor is supporting everything, prolapse means... It's gonna sound very scary. So if basically the prolapse means something's coming down. So if the pelvic floor muscles and or connected connective tissue cannot support the organs anymore, then those organs can start to come down towards the vaginal entrance. Okay, I know this sounds very scary, but that's also why I was saying, please don't strain with bowel movements or urination. Okay, because that is a risk factor, which means that can lead to pelvic organ prolapse. Okay, so the three types of prolapse are, Bladder prolapse, okay, uterine prolapse, and then uh, bowel prolapse. Did I just say bowel again? So bladder, bowel, and uterine prolapse, okay? And there's different degrees and grades of prolapse. I would say, you know, most people don't feel they have the minor levels of prolapse, and then they continue to strain, you know, they're continuing to doing, you know, they're doing certain things that are putting them more at risk for prolapse. And then the other end that I see is, you know, women coming in, it's either, you know, it could be, you know, outside of pregnancy, um, it could be during pregnancy, postpartum, or into their 50s, 60s, 70s, and they're literally coming in, they feel something there, they see something there, their bladder, for example, is so low at their vaginal entrance, and they come in and they're like, oh my gosh, what is this? I thought this was a tumor. I went to the doctor. They told me it's my bladder. And now either I have to get surgery or they sent me to you for pelvic floor physiotherapy. Okay, so at that point, we're doing a lot of Kegels, okay, to help with that because Kegels have been shown to help prevent pelvic organ prolapse. They've been shown to reduce the grade of pelvic organ prolapse. That's something that I'm teaching each and every person that's coming in, especially prenatally, because during labor and delivery, what is happening? So during pregnancy, there's a lot of weight on the pelvic floor muscles, okay? Postpartum, or sorry, during labor and delivery, the muscles have to lengthen, right? And so there's reduced support for those organs. So if those organs cannot be appropriately supported by pelvic floor muscles, then they may start to shift, they may start to come down, okay? So I am actually going to and this is not going to be a scary picture, but I want to show you kind of like what the cartoon version of what um, pelvic floor uh, or sorry, bladder prolapse might look like. So I'm just going to share my screen again with you guys. So just so you can get a sense of it, because most people have just heard about this in terms of, you know, my grandma had to get a bladder lift. My mom had to get a bladder lift, but really it is affecting women younger and younger. And I just want you to get a sense of kind of like what that really means. So. How will I do this? Because I'm just pulling this up. Okay, so I'm going to do this, share, and let's go to prolapse. So you should see a picture kind of come up. Hopefully that's big enough for you. If it's not, I'm sorry. Um, but on the left side here, so hopefully you can see my cursor. So basically it's just showing the regular anatomical position of all the organs. So bladder, uterus, bowel on the right-hand side is showing the bladders coming down. Okay, this is mild prolapse. Nobody really feels this, okay? but that is kind of like pushing the vagina down towards its entrance and really it's not the bladder that we see that's coming down usually it's like the vagina that's being literally pushed down and out okay and then the other two would be the uterus as well as bowel so hopefully i didn't scare you too much there but the reason why i like to talk about this is because a lot of women have this um, and but they don't know about it and so you can see me again and then you know they're either engaging in high uh, physical activity um, or you know with repeated uh, births and stuff like that there can be progression of prolapse so what are the risk factors for prolapse so let's talk about that chronic constipation 
Okay. Um, chronic respiratory disease. So if someone's, you know, really, you know, coughing a lot, that's a lot of pressure down on the pelvic floor, chronic constipation, it would be the person is straining. Okay. Um, physical activity. Okay. I should actually rephrase that. Repeated physical exertion. Okay. So particularly in exercise has not been shown to cause prolapse, but if someone say at work is doing, you know, a lot of lifting, and they're holding their breath and they're creating that pressure that's going directly onto the pelvic floor, that may lead to prolapse. And I would just say with regards to that, so maybe physical activity, you know, hasn't been shown to cause it because, you know, if someone's doing yoga, it's okay. If someone's, you know, maybe, you know, doing low aerobic activity, that's fine. But if someone is doing, you know, high intensity, you know, either activity, uh, interval workouts, or if they're doing weightlifting, and if you're holding your breath, please make sure you're not holding your breath because that can cause a lot of pressure on the pelvic floor and push stuff down, okay? And the reason I wanted to mention that is, so let's go back to when I was talking about urinary retention as well as, you know, bowel retention. So if you have that, if you feel like you have to strain, please use that technique of breathing instead of pushing. Okay, because that may lead to increased intra-abdominal pressure. The other thing is if you are constantly sucking in your stomach, a lot of women do this. If you're always trying to bring, you know, your belly to your spine, that kind of thing, that increases intra-abdominal pressure. Okay, and if you look at, you can quickly Google this if you want to, but if you think about women who used to wear corsets, and there's, you know, those pictures out there, which would show that their organs would be displaced up and down, that is intra-abdominal pressure leading to that shift. Okay. The other risk factor is more kids. <laughs> okay. So, and I think that really has to do with kind of like how we're teaching, you know, women how to push during labor and delivery. Are you holding your breath? Are you breathing? We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Most people are told to hold their breath and push really, really hard. It's called purple based pushing. So that's just something to avoid. And that's where a pelvic floor physiotherapist can help you as well as other professionals. Uh, of course, um, but that's just something that I am very, very passionate about because so I have prolapse. Um, I found out probably a couple of years ago, I don't have any kids. And since I was a child, a baby, I, you know, my mom was like, oh my God, I had to take you to the hospital. You were chronically just like constipated and no one told me not to push. So I push, 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 push. A couple of years ago, I was like, I feel something's weird. I'm going to pee my pants. It just feels weird down there. So I checked and I was like, oh my gosh, there's prolapse. So I've done my own rehab. I'm a pelvic floor physio. I know what to do. And now I can run, jump, do whatever I want to do. And I'm not really worried about it. Okay. But that's just kind of like letting you know that if there is, you know, if this is non-pregnancy related in terms of why you're here, just to be aware of what you're doing. So let's move on and talk about pain. Okay. Because we still have a little bit more to cover. Pelvic pain is huge. So this could be pain in the pubic bone tailbone um, if you're sitting for any period of time um, this could be in the hips the low back this could be literally in the crotch vaginal area the groin this could be pain with intercourse those are seven different pains that i listed that i described as you know like pelvic pain because it's anything really in the core i would actually say abdominal pain too so that's the core so that's eight different types of pain okay pubic pain is usually experienced during pregnancy when the woman's you know womb is growing and there could be additional pressure on the pelvic floor this could be if you're rolling from side to side you're getting up you're going from sitting to standing you're lifting your leg up you know going up the stairs that kind of thing and it usually feels like you know my pubic bone feels like it's bruised there's sharp shooting pain um it might feel like people call it lightning crotch okay then we have tailbone pain so that would be if you're sitting you know for any amount of time and you literally feel it on that point pressure of the tailbone Okay, and usually that is with, you know, sitting, the surface you're sitting on. So if you experience this, please make sure if it's a hard chair, put a cushion there, you know, sit on an exercise ball. That's an awesome way to also kind of like take control of your posture, right? But that's something I usually recommend during pregnancy, okay? Groin pain, that's kind of like going into that inguinal groin area that could be with various types of activities. Um, hip pain, sciatica, that's also kind of involved um, in the pelvic area. And then pain with intercourse is something I see so much. This is, you know, outside of pregnancy. Um, it could be related to other conditions as well. So if someone has interstitial cystitis, if you don't know what that is, you probably 
you know, don't have it. Um, endometriosis, um, if there is, you know, kind of like gastrointestinal stuff going on that can cause inflammation of the muscles, the pelvic muscles and make them tighten. And then during pregnancy, because of the weight of the baby, um, that can also lead to the muscles being a little bit tighter. As and then postpartum depends on if there's any scar tissue from episiotomy um, or if there's any tearing and there's scarring of the scar tissue. Most women think that they're going to be loose is the best way to kind of like describe it postpartum but i have found 50 percent of my clients are tight after a vaginal delivery after cesarean nine out of ten of my patients have tight pelvic floor muscles and you're probably wondering why there was no vaginal delivery because they go through the abdominal layer the pelvic floor muscles underneath are like whoa we have to help support we better start working and they literally clench up like this okay and i've had so many clients like that but i just want you to know if you have pain with intercourse you should not be experiencing pain with intercourse it could be the muscles it could be vaginal dryness because of breastfeeding it could be hormonal stuff but either way you shouldn't be experiencing it if you are experiencing it i would say seek help because what can happen especially with pain with intercourse is a few things so if there's pain, sex is supposed to be pleasurable, then your brain goes, oh my gosh, that hurt. The next time around, it's going to, going to anticipate the pain and the muscles can then clench in anticipation. And then if you continue, the muscles can get tighter and tighter and they can actually get more sensitive. And we call this central nervous system sensitization, where the muscles are not really causing the pain anymore. It's like your brain is like, oh my gosh, please stop doing this. I'm just going to make this area so sensitive that this person stops doing this activity and it could just be you know like the thought of intercourse can cause pain just like having underwear on it could be you know like when you're thinking about like or penetration is happening then it, there it, there is a lot of pain so that is gotten to a point where like the nervous system is involved the brain is involved and that can take a little bit more as in longer to treat so if you are having that pain i would say please stop and seek help from a pelvic floor physio okay so i know that was a lot of information the one thing i want to cover um is pelvic or sorry uh, abdominal separation and that's this is more kind of i have seen clients outside of pregnancy with this but this is usually a postpartum thing that i see so if someone's coming in and they're like i feel like there's you know a huge gap in my belly i feel like i'm still pregnant i feel like there's bulging in my stomach that kind of thing so i'm just gonna show you a picture with regards to that so it makes more sense because for a lot of you like so it actually the actual term for it is rectus um so diastasis recti and so what it looks like would be this so you're going to see the normal version of kind of the body and then you're going to see the diastasis recti version um and this also relates to core training which we will kind of talk about as well so you're just going to see a picture pop up there on the left side it's showing you know normal alignment right side it is showing a huge gap okay and i would say this is like a bigger <laughs> gap than i usually see but during pregnancy your muscles have to literally lengthen to accommodate for baby and if they lengthen and then afterwards you know if you're applying you know if you go back into doing you know crunches and planks and you're like oh my gosh i noticed there is bulging there or i notice i still have mummy tummy four to six months after pregnancy like it still looks like you're pregnant i've had clients say the feel they're still pregnant people are making comments it's humiliating because they're like i'm actually not pregnant right now right so that is why it's because there might be abdominal separation and this can happen to anyone so when i say anyone i mean anyone i had um a 70 year old male client come in he was having leakages so we were treating that he comes in one day and he says now i like there's this like something's coming out of my stomach and i was like whoa i think that's outside of my scope of practice are you bleeding like what's going on he's like no 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 let me just show you he lay down did a crunch there was like this huge bulge coming out of his stomach and i was like okay what did you do over the last like few weeks since i saw you for this to occur because you did not have this you know last time and he said i've been doing a lot of heavy lifting in the garage and you know doing renovations and stuff and i was like okay are you holding your breath yes so that pressure had to go somewhere for him it went into the abdominal area Okay, this is a, probably the most important part of the whole presentation. Pressure is so important. Leakages happen because of pressure. There's too much pressure on the pelvic floor it cannot handle. 
Abdominal separation happens because there's pressure, okay? The abdominal wall cannot withstand the pressure, and then there's that bulge that's happening or separation. Pelvic organ prolapse happens because there's too much pressure. The pressure had to go somewhere, so it's literally pushing the vagina down towards its entrance. Everything surrounding, most things surrounding pelvic floor issues is surrounding pressure. So think about how you're breathing. We're going to go over breathing technique in a couple minutes, okay? Because if you're breathing into your chest, if you're holding your breath, if you're straining on the toilet, um, all those things cause a lot of pressure in your abdomen. And if it's happening repeatedly, that may lead to pelvic floor issues, okay? And if you have any of those things, that's just a good thing to think about, okay? So there are a few questions in there that we're going to be, I'll address them towards the end. Um, in Actually, I'll address it right now. So in terms of preventing diastasis, so there are studies out there that show, you know, 100% of women during pregnancy have abdominal separation, um, you know, and then about 40% have it postpartum, right? So is it, you know, the way the baby was sitting? Is the way you were carrying? Is it, you know, the strength of the muscles? Um, there are not a lot of studies out there showing, you know, we can prevent diastasis. I myself am always assessing and giving exercises to my clients during pregnancy, especially if they come in early, to get them to contract their core. So that's, you know, get them to strengthen their back, their abdomen, the transverse abdominus, which is the saran wrap muscle, to activate the pelvic floor for them to all work together because, the stronger you are going into pregnancy, the faster you're gonna recover after, okay? And this is something that I didn't even like come up with. I used to work with orthopedic surgeons, which are surgeons, you know, they do like knee surgery, hip surgery, shoulders, that kind of thing. And they would constantly say, you know, the stronger you are going into surgery, the faster you're gonna recover after. Most clients, it's getting better, but most clients are being sent to me postpartum. A lot of healthcare professionals are like, well, you don't have any issues. You know, just go to the pelvic physio after if you have issues. I'm trying to change that. I've had women come to me preconception. They're like, you know what? I'm going to, you know, we're going to try. We're going to try and get pregnant. And um, in the meantime, though, can you teach me how to do Kegels? Can you teach me, you know, strengthening exercises so that I don't have any issues during pregnancy? I don't have any issues postpartum. So my goal is really, you know, maximizing health and prevention. That's where healthcare should be anyways. Why are we really focusing on so much on treatment if we can prevent all these things? So back to your question about if we can prevent diastasis, I clinically have found if I'm giving exercises to my clients during pregnancy, then that's leading to less issues postpartum, whether it's diastasis, leakages, whether it's tearing during you know, labor and delivery, pelvic organ prolapse, pain, all that stuff. And honestly, it just makes it better for them and for me. I have to treat less postpartum. They have to come in less. It's, you know, harder when you have a baby to be like, oh my gosh, let me schedule this virtual appointment with NAB or let me go in person because it's just like you have no time, right? And the faster you cover after, then the faster you can get back to all the activities that you like to do, right? All the physical activity you want to do, you can return to intercourse faster. You can return to, you know, like doing your leisure activities without feeling like, oh my gosh, my vagina is going to fall out. I have leeches. I'm broken. Something's wrong with me because that's consistently what I hear from women postpartum. Okay. Um, okay. And Prithika just said, is it my connection? I can't see your video. It's all right. Okay. So hopefully everyone can see me there. Okay. So that is that. Let's talk a little bit about Kegels. Okay. So has everyone heard about a Kegel? I should have made a poll about this, but does, yeah, does everyone know you've heard Kegels before or someone, some people say Kegels? You know, so if you've heard about Kegels and you haven't really been told, you know, how to do them, there is a particular way to do it. So we're going to be doing that right now because I love doctors. I've worked with a lot of doctors, but they're always telling people to do a Kegel when they're urinating. If you're doing, if you're trying to stop the flow of urine when you're urinating, please stop. That can lead to bladder infections. Your muscles are supposed to relax when you're urinating, not contract. So yeah, that's one thing. And then the second thing is no one is actually telling you exactly how to do Kegels. Do I hold my breath? Do I breathe? Most people tend to hold their breath and they're just contracting other muscles, which is warranted because you can't see your pelvic muscles, right? So if I tell you to do a bicep curl, yeah, you can see, you know, your arm, you can contract it up and down. But if I tell you to do Kegels, you're like, uh, which muscles are those? So now you know what the muscles are. We're going to go through 
um, kind of like how to do a Kegel right now. So the first thing I actually want you to do is try doing whatever you feel a Kegel is, okay? So I, that's all the instruction I'm gonna give. So take five seconds, you know, do it, you know, once, twice, just feel. If you don't know what a Kegel is, that's okay. We're gonna talk about that in a second. <laughs> okay, but just do whatever you feel like a Kegel is right now, okay? And just try it, okay? Remember how it felt, because it might feel differently after. Okay, so what is a Kegel? Kegel is a pelvic contraction, okay? So the pelvic floor literally has to contract, pull up and in. A lot of people think it's just the clenching. No, so if there's a cough, sneeze, jumping happening, and the pelvic floor has to support, it's clenching upwards, okay? Not just like this, and that's usually where people are not doing it correctly, and that's usually where people are having issues with leakages, with prolapse, with other things going on, okay? Just pay attention to how you did the Kegel, okay, in terms of where you were contracting, okay? So biggest part about doing a Kegel is breathing. Okay, you're probably like, what? I thought it was the contraction. No, it's the breathing. So if you think back to that diagram or picture that I showed you about the core, your diaphragm, the breathing muscle that's underneath the ribs, works together. How can I do this so you can see? Mm, okay, so this is the diaphragm, this is the pelvic floor. They work together. As you inhale, everything moves down because air is coming in, okay? As you exhale, everything is coming back up, okay? So we're gonna use our breath right now to do a Kegel. Just find a comfortable spot. I need you to have back support. If you don't have back support, it's gonna be harder to do a Kegel, okay? If you're lying down, that's actually even better. Um, if you're pregnant right now, I don't want you really like being in you know uncomfortable position. So if lying down is not an option or you feel uncomfortable, just do it in sitting with back support. So I'm going to get everybody to take a nice deep breath in to their belly, okay? Pay attention to where the breath is going because we're going to talk about breathing. Okay, I'm going to move this down so you guys can see me a little bit more. And then you're going to exhale out through your mouth, okay? So five seconds into your belly as you inhale, and then as you're exhaling, it's out through your mouth. Okay, try that a couple of times for me. Okay, so I'm going to show you something. A lot of people especially as we get older. So if you look at babies, they tend to breathe into their belly. As we get older, we tend to breathe into our chest. You'll notice if someone's 70 or 80 years old, they are doing this. <sighs> okay, that is not optimal breathing. Also our ribs get, you know, kind of stiff over time. But if you're doing belly breathing when you're, or sorry, if you're doing chest breathing when you're younger, you're not optimizing and using the pelvic floor and the diaphragm and your, you know, blow back and the abdominal muscles properly, and you're not engaging and you're not going to be able to do a pelvic floor contraction properly. So if you especially notice you're breathing into your chest, one hand on your chest, one on your belly, okay, you're going to do a very, very slow inhale. The first sip of the inhale is very important. So you're going to do a very slow inhale into your belly. Think about either one of two things. Think about a balloon filling up, okay? And then as you exhale, just a regular exhale out through your mouth. Okay, do that a couple times. The other thing you can think about is, this is going to seem silly, you think about an umbrella inside your stomach, and as you inhale, it's opening up, and as you exhale, it's closing, okay? If you're finding this is very difficult, you need to have good back support, good head support. Um, this is something, honestly, some patients come in, I'm spending 10 to 15 minutes going over breathing, okay? So if it's not coming naturally to you, there's a reason your body is used to breathing into your chest. And to do a proper Kegel, you should be able to breathe into your belly. It is harder to breathe into your belly when you're pregnant, but you should still be able to do it. Okay, so that's the first step. So you're like, okay, cool, I got the breathing. When do we do the Kegel? You wanna do the Kegel on the exhale, okay? Everyone thinks they're like, oh, I'm gonna inhale and I'm gonna suck in at the same time. No, let's go back to the inhale, exhale. So pelvic floor here, diaphragm, or sorry, diaphragm here, pelvic floor here. So as you inhale, everything moves down. Pelvic floor does not want to contract when everything's moving down, okay? As you exhale, that is when the pelvic floor naturally moves back up into the body, and that's where you want to use the exhale to help facilitate the Kegel, the contraction, without using too much of your abdominal muscles. When you're exhaling, make sure it's a gentle five-second exhale, okay? Do not blow out like you're trying to blow a candle. So I'm just going to turn sideways. <sighs> no. It should be gentle so that you can't really, like the person sitting next to you, if there is anybody, they can't really hear it. Okay, and it's very, very slow. Okay, and that's naturally when you're doing the pelvic for contraction slowly inside. Okay, otherwise, it's just your abdominal muscles are contracting. It should feel subtle and it should feel small. The thing to think about when you're doing Kegels is you can think about a marble at the vaginal entrance and you're trying to pull it up and in as you're doing an exhale. So, everybody can try that right now. So, inhale into the belly as you exhale. Think about a marble coming in 
and then as you inhale, you can release it. The other thing you can think about is stopping the flow of urine. Okay, so while you don't want to do this when you're sitting on the toilet, you do want to do this, you know, outside of that. So you can think about doing that as well. Okay, I usually give, I mean, I don't give a lot of Kegels, honestly. Some people say do 50, do 100. I'm usually doing like, you know, 15, 20, something along those lines. And usually we progress them in physio. So if someone's, you know, like I have leakages and in postpartum, I've done Kegels lying down for six months. Well, that's like me doing, I don't know, bicep curls lying down for six months. And then I'm trying to do something functional and I can't because doing bicep curls lying down is not functional. Same thing, like doing Kegels lying down does not transfer to jumping. So I would be progressing my clients through lying down, sitting, standing, walking, squats, lunges, jumping, that kind of stuff, because that's more functional. So if you have issues, you've gone to pelvic physio, you're doing Kegels, it's not resolving, it's probably the way you're doing Kegels and also the position you're doing Kegels in. So I hope that makes a lot of sense. The final thing is with Kegels, Kegels are not for everybody. Okay, so if you've been doing Kegels and you're like, oh my gosh, I have urinary urgency frequency, it's not improving. Um, I have other things going on, it's not improving. It's probably because your muscles might be too tight inside and we shouldn't be doing Kegels. Okay, so certain conditions, if you're doing Kegels and it's making your symptoms worse, please stop. Okay, those conditions are urinary urgency frequency, it could be bowel urgency frequency, um, pelvic pain, pain with intercourse, any other type of pelvic girdle pain that I had listed previously, even leakages. If you're doing Kegels and you have leakages, it could be because your muscles are too tight. And I know this is kind of like a, what is she talking about thing. If your muscles are very tight and you have a cough or sneeze or you're jumping and the pelvic floor is so tight, it can't contract anymore. It's actually going to release. Okay. And then you might get leakage, which I know sounds crazy, but your pelvic floor like it has to be at an optimal length for it to function the way it's supposed to and if that's not happening that could be why your condition or symptoms are worsening or why it's not improving okay so just keep that in mind um final couple of things that we have here is um i'm going to talk a little bit about so prepping for labor and delivery it's, i would say most prenatal classes are not really talking about pushing techniques um, prenatally and so if you are pregnant and you're wondering about you know are there different ways to push and why does pushing even matter um, most hospitals these days are telling their clients um, their patients to push with it's called purple face pushing basically they get you to hold for 10 seconds and push really really hard world health organization american midwives association as well as american college of obstetricians and gynecologists and most people are not following the following these standards of guidelines which is something else i'm trying to change they say to allow the woman to breathe, to push however she wants to push. Regardless of that, I have found this is more so when I was in Toronto than Calgary. I've heard some great stuff about, you know, the hospitals in Calgary, but for sure in Toronto, most of my clients were being told to, you know, hold your breath for 10 seconds, push really hard. That can lead to hemorrhoids, tearing, prolapse. I wonder if that's why prolapse happens. So I tend to teach my clients how to push and breathe at the same time. That is patient specific because it really depends on, you know, my assessment. It depends on like how you're breathing already, what the strength is, like all those different things. But if you haven't encountered that concept before, I would really research into, you know, going to a pelvic floor physiotherapist or, you know, looking into if your prenatal class is teaching you that because I have found most prenatal classes are not teaching that. Okay. And whatever I teach is kind of like a tool in your toolbox. You don't have to for sure do it, but it is something to kind of consider using your breath to push versus, you know, you do it right now. Just like inhale, hold, try to push. It feels hard and doesn't feel good. Okay. Whereas if you're trying to like exhale and push at the same time down there, it usually feels a little bit easier to do. Okay. Labor and delivery is exhausting. Let's make it a little bit less exhausting and let's make it a little bit less harder on the pelvic floor. The other thing I teach usually is um, um, perineal massage, okay? So this is specifically, and this is massage for the pelvic muscles for a few different reasons, okay? So let's just talk about massage for the pelvic muscles in general. Prenatally, perineal massage has been shown to reduce the grade of tearing during labor and delivery, which is awesome. Pelvic massage has been shown to be helpful in reducing pelvic pain. So if you have 
chronic persistent pelvic pain, if you have pain with intercourse, um, if you have urinary urgency frequency, doing pelvic massage can help with those symptoms, okay? And then postpartum, if there's any scar tissue, it can help with that as well, okay? So there's certain techniques that we use. It really is dependent on like, you know, my client, their goals, what their muscles are like, what's going on, is there scar tissue, is there not scar tissue, what their needs are. But doing perineal massage has been shown to help reduce the grade of tearing and it's been shown to help with all these different pain conditions. So I usually am teaching that as well. So that's just something to kind of like note down because after this, say you're like, okay, I'm going to go see a pelvic floor physiotherapist, either a, you know, I just want to know about my pelvic health prevention, all that good stuff. That's amazing. Or I have issues prenatally and postpartum, or I want to maximize my health prenatally, prevent issues postpartum. You really want to make sure you're going to somebody that obviously A, does public health, women's public health, or male public health, whoever you are online right now. Um, the other thing is, especially during pregnancy, you want to go to somebody who does deal with uh, women prenatally because if you go to someone and they just do general pelvic health they won't know how to teach you how to push most likely they will not know how to teach you perineal massage they might teach you how to do kegels and stuff like that but it's missing that component so before you book in with someone do realize that okay having said that so i'm gonna show you guys something and this might look scary so Try not to get too scared. So I'm just going to bring up a picture of a tool that we use for releasing the pelvic floor, okay? So if you're like, oh my gosh, how do I massage myself down there? Like I can, you know, I know there's a sore muscle. I know I'm supposed to massage. I can't do it, right? I have pain with intercourse or like I want to, you know, prenatally, you know, I want to reach down there, but I can't do it because it's hard. If you're not doing this with a partner, it's so hard to reach down there. So this is, gonna look scary but i'm gonna show you what a pelvic wand looks like which is um kind of like the tools of the trade of a pelvic physio um okay so if that just looks crazy for to you i'm sorry but that's literally what we use okay so if someone is coming in person and i'm showing them you know like i'm doing the massage on them you know and then i'm like okay i want you to do this at home and they're like i can't reach down there i'm like okay you should you probably should go buy this, okay? Because it's going to be ineffective for you. Either way, you're going to end up straining your arm, your, you know, your wrist, that kind of stuff, unless you're doing it with a partner, okay? So if you have any of those conditions that I talked about in terms of pain, if you know anybody who has any of those pain conditions, tell them about this wand, okay? Up until like three weeks ago, I was sending my clients to this one website online and they sold out. So I've started selling this on my website, um, if you find a cheaper one, go for it. But the big thing I would usually say is, please make sure you know how to use it. <laughs> please make sure you know, you know, like if you're doing it by yourself, you don't really need it. Or sorry, if you're doing it by yourself, you need it. But if you're doing it with a partner, you don't need it. Okay, so that's just kind of like those big things. And then just like the safety around and positioning and stuff. Usually I would discuss that with a client. Okay, but I know that it just looks like kind of scary there. Okay. Um, do I have anything else to add? I'm going to open up the floor, I think, for questions. And in the meantime, I'll just keep talking because I do want to talk about a little bit about um, cesarean section. So women are still at risk postpartum after cesarean for risk of leakages, um, risk of, you know, pain with intercourse, urinary urgency, all that kind of stuff. So if you have a scheduled C-section or if you have had a C-section, just know it's still good to go into see a public floor physiotherapist to see how you're doing. And the other thing is if you're postpartum and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. How do I return back to activity? I'm not sure. Um, what should I be doing? And where are the guidelines? There are no guidelines for postpartum. Everyone says, oh, it's six weeks, um, you know, return back to whatever you wanna do. That I would say is a falsehood. That's kind of like what we say about anything. If you've had an ankle, fracture, a wrist sprain, if you've had surgery, um, C-section, vaginal delivery, everyone's like six weeks and you're fine. But if you think about it, if you've had a cast on your wrist and after six weeks they take it off, you're not okay. <laughs> like you still need to strengthen, you need to stretch, you need to make sure the mobility is there. You're not just gonna go back into, you know, like playing basketball or tennis and stuff like that or doing push-ups. You need to do that rehab. So in terms of returning back to activity, it is patient dependent. It really depends on how your strength is, how your mobility is, what your goals are, and that's how a pelvic physiotherapist or another professional should be helping you. Usually physicians are saying,